Mr. Lockheed, who's up here, gets wind of Montgomery's work, and his brothers, Alan and Malcolm, are living in the Bay Area, and they're very inspired by the Montgomery Public Exhibitions. So the three of them learn about this, and Montgomery becomes up on their radar. Uh, Victor was an engineer and an author of uh, mostly um, automobile journals. And uh, he's one of the founding members of the uh, automobile, uh, the maybe aviation uh, Anyway, Victor wrote one of the first classics of aviation, a compendium of aviation history in 1909. Montgomery has uh, written about prominently throughout. And uh, Victor comes out to California in 1907 and visits Montgomery, and he receives uh, essentially with the same thing that Baldwin was exposed to. Is, uh, the construction of the heavy and machine, the technology behind it, and through a series of wind tunnel experiments, he was taught the, the uh, airfoil theory and propeller theory. So, Victor is yet another student of Montgomery's who had a significant exposure to this information at a time when a lot of it was very uh, forward thinking in the trail. Victor goes back, and, and a little bit later in time, he designs an airplane that becomes the Lockheed Brothers. What, what, they're really the first famous aircraft. They were seated in this, it's a seaplane. Victor designed it uh, based significantly on technology and theory received from John Montgomery. The, the Lockheed Brothers would go on, of course, to be uh, prominent designers and manufacturers of aircraft. And so there's a Montgomery, one degree of separation between Montgomery and the Lockheed Brothers and their legacy. Uh, 1907, this is an airship competition. All three of these are identical to the California era. For about, from 1904 to about 1911, the California era serves as the basic template for American airships. Everybody who's flying airships in America, 95% of them are flying replicas of the California era in their paper. All of these people became famous um, and very influential, and they're all using propellers, ultimately, that, based on Montgomery's idea. So in uh, early 1907, the AEA forms, and Alexander Graham Bell is the lead person. We have uh, Lynn Curtis is over here, and a number of other people, all of whom became quite famous. And the first thing they do is learn how to fly through a glider. So they take Chanute's plans for a glider, and then Baldwin joins them. He's still working with Curtis from time to time. He's basically, by this point in time, everything Curtis knows about aeronautics is through Baldwin. He had no background in aeronautics at all before, strictly motor motorcycle technology. So uh, Curtis, when this group forms, serves as a lead engineer. And you can bet that he's imparting information. Some of it probably doesn't even know what its origin is, but then he got it through Baldwin. He's imparting this information to this group. It will soon become very well known, very successful in a number of aircraft. Uh, here, Curtis has uh, continued to work with this three-wheel machine. He's got a propeller in the back of it, a little more refined, and now he's got a surface in the front. He can test the uh, lifting characteristics and the efficiency of the propeller. If you look at this thing carefully, you can see the basic framework for his June bike and some of his later craft. So he's slowly working out a platform here. Uh, in 1908, the Army puts out contracts for a lighter than air flying machine and a heavier than air flying machine. And they give specifications and they have a they hold a competition. Here's Baldwin with a larger craft, and now he has a cruciform tail. He learned that from Montgomery. And he has uh, biplane surfaces up here that can be used to uh, direct the uh, longitudinal direction of the craft. He won this competition. The Wrights won the competition for the heavier than air category. But this, this machine was literally the, the U.S. military's first aircraft of any kind. The Wrights craft was adopted a year later. So uh, this is just an example of how Montgomery was able to influence people elsewhere in the world. This is a group based in Vienna. And they formed a society. They wanted to get into aviation. So like most people at the time, they adopted gliders first. They looked through the literature and decided that the leading designs were three. The, what they call the Chinook, the Lilienthal in the background, and the Montgomery. Through a series of 
of experiments going up a steep hillside here, foot launching, they decided Montgomery was the most, uh, gave the most lifting power for its design. So they went ahead and uh, started manufacturing what they call the sailplane based on this the Montgomery model. It's not exactly like the Santa Clara. I think they're largely using uh, weight shifting to control it. But the idea here is that Montgomery was one of, you know, these three people were mentioned, William Dahl, Schmidt, Montgomery, were the lead people that they thought uh, their designs had the most warrant. Uh, this is just an example of uh, Cleve Schaefer and his sister Janine formed a man uh, aircraft manufacturing company in the Bay Area. They were the most prominent manufacturers in the Western United States at that period of time. They learned how to fly uh, by John Montgomery instructed them in up the hillside of San Bruno. And uh, they learned to fly first in gliders and then eventually with, uh, they built a powered machine which they manufactured. And they were quite successful. Uh, late 1909, the Wright brothers moved to capitalize on their, uh, all the success they had with their patents and their manufacturing, their licensing, and they formed the Wright Company through uh, a group of Wall Street investors, people like Vanderbilt, uh, and others, Belmont, and uh, these guys at the time were infamous for forming uh, trusts and uh, monopolies. So the Wrights were really that was their philosophy, is they wanted to maximize the uh, money they could make off this. They moved to start suppressing other people out there who were attempting to make money. They threatened to sue them, they enjoined them through court actions, and uh, they tried to get the Aero Club, they successfully got the Aero Club of America to only sanction aviation meets in America that the Wright brothers agreed, the Wright company agreed with. And uh, it was all about money. The amount of royalties the rights would receive is uh, based largely in greed. Uh, what's interesting about this is here's Orville's journal that records what actually happened December 17th of 1903. What the history books tell you is it was the first example of controlled, sustained, heavier than air power flight. The control and sustained part of the most significant. That's what sets it apart from all others, and that's what makes them the people who solve the problem of flight. However, if you read Orville's journal, you'll see that four relatively short flights were attempted. They were all straight, just above the ground, and all of them, they were they could barely control of them. Two of those flights ended in crashes that they could easily repair the crack. So the idea that it's sustained and control, I think, is highly suspect. And it wasn't until at a later point in time, about late 1905, that they finally worked out all the problems and came up with a practical flyer, which they then could offer up to a government, a military. Uh, so in our view, they embellished what happened at Kitty Hawk over time, increasingly, because it fit with this whole idea that they were the ones who solved the problem of flight. They did Montgomery's aeronauts were flying at will over the Bay Area in 1905 without any benefit from the Red Brothers at all. Uh, 19, January 1910, they held a, uh, this is another thing that's kind of slid into obscurity, they held a, the first international aviation meet in America was in Los Angeles. Two weeks later, the second one was in San Francisco, the Tam Ferran track. John attended this meet, and for the first time in his life, could sort of see the whole thing come full circle. Now there are these people, this whole younger generation, who only a few years before knew nothing about aeronautics. Now all of a sudden they're uh, very skilled aviators, very successful, and they're making money at it. And he attended this meet, and it must, for him it must have been really an amazing experience to see all of this come back around. And there's some really interesting quotes from him in the newspaper this time. He said, you know, this is nothing, this is nothing new to me, but it's interesting seeing it done under power. Uh, in, 19, in 1910, he sold the rights to an invention, got a fair amount of money out of it, and on the strength of that, he hired a mechanic and a pilot, and they built this craft, the Evergreen. Um, interesting design, it's a monoplane, and this all of the control is built into this wing, and he had a gilt. Initially, he used these upright bars in his right and left hand to control this wing uh, in roll but uh, later he adopted a yoke, a steering yoke, like they would have on a modern aircraft. This was in 1911. 
Um, he did a number of successful flights in the Evergreen Foothills by Evergreen College. Uh, unfortunately, in one of these flights, he lost control and the craft crashed and he uh, sustained fatal injuries. That was October 31st of 1911. You can still go back there to the field, to the hills above where this photo was taken. Look down there and it's just as it was over 100 years ago. Nothing has changed. Off in the distance now, there's a college, but they've uh, preserved this area as a county park, Montgomery Hill Park. It's worth going to, it's a beautiful place, and uh, just historically, it's very interesting. So, um, kind of bringing it back around, here's that same image, image I started out at the beginning. Again, if you back out, uh, these are all pioneering achievements in both classes of aviation. Not only uh, airships, but parachute jumping, uh, ballooning, uh, gliders, hungry than air flying machines. This all happened in the Bay Area. And if you back this image out and look at the entire United States, you can see that the Bay Area is a focus of pioneering aviation in both classes at a period of time when society didn't even believe it was possible for man to fly. One last thing I wanted to point out is the book is six inches wide. I've experimented with this and it fits perfectly snugly into a Christmas stocking. So, on so, yeah, there. Thank you.